You have just reviewed a lot of information intended to help us understand the health and physical hazards associated with the materials we handle every day. If we're able to work safely with these materials, we must be able to gather and properly interpret information on their toxicological and physical hazards. It is the sum of these hazardous characteristics that define the risks associated with handling and storing a particular material and dictates the procedures we must follow. Let's take a moment to review and apply what we have learned to a material that many of us handle every day, diesel fuel. During this exercise, I'm going to pose a series of questions to you. Here is the first one. Where can we go to learn about the hazardous properties of diesel fuel? Two primary sources for information on the hazardous properties of chemicals were described in the training, the NIOSH Pocket Guide and the supplier's MSDS. However, in this case, no information can be found in the NIOSH Pocket Guide on diesel fuel. This is not unusual for chemical mixtures such as diesel fuel. In these cases, we must review a supplier's MSDS such as this one from ExxonMobil. Let's look into the toxicological hazards associated with diesel fuel first. But what can we learn about the acute and chronic toxicity of diesel fuel from this MSDS? Information on the toxicity of a chemical can generally be found in Section 11 of an MSDS which is titled appropriately, Toxicology. A summary of this information may be found in Section 3 titled, Hazards Identification. This MSDS indicates diesel fuel has both acute or immediate health effects and chronic or long-term health effects. The acute toxicity of a diesel fuel, as measured by the lethal dose required to kill 50% of a laboratory test animal population, is considered minimally toxic. This is evident from the very high doses required to kill test animals by each exposure route, inhalation, ingestion, and skin contact. However, just because it would take a very high dose of diesel fuel to cause a death does not mean a lower dose will not cause some other acute health effects. As a young operator, I found out that diesel fuel was a good way to clean your machine. Put a little on a rag, shine your machine up, stick it in your back pocket, walk around a little bit, shine a little more, until I found out two days later that I had a nice red rash on my rear end that I couldn't sit down for quite some time because of diesel fuel affecting my skin. Diesel fuel can irritate the skin as well as remove oil from the skin causing it to become dry and cracked. Vapor concentrations above the recommended exposure levels are irritating to the eyes and the respiratory tract and may cause headaches and dizziness as well as other central nervous system effects. Important chronic hazards are also listed. Diesel fuel may cause skin cancer as well as have reproductive effects. So, what does this tell us about how we should be handling diesel fuel? We need to prevent skin and eye contact by wearing chemical protective clothing over parts of the body that may be splashed or come into direct contact with diesel fuel. This would include gloves and eye protection when refueling, gloves, eye protection, and potentially an apron or chemical protective suit when maintaining heavy equipment and the splash potential is high, and even wearing a full body chemical protective suit when entering and cleaning a marine fuel tank. The level of protection is dictated by the task and potential for skin contact. We also need to practice good personal hygiene by washing after handling diesel fuel and before eating, drinking, and smoking. Finally, work clothing and protective equipment must be washed regularly to remove contaminants. This takes care of skin contact and ingestion, but what about inhalation? We learned that inhalation exposures above the recommended exposure levels are irritating to the eyes and the respiratory tract and may cause headaches and dizziness as well as other central nervous system effects. But what are these levels? Where can the relevant exposure standards be found? The NIOSH Pocket Guide would contain a complete listing of exposure standards and guidelines if there was an entry for diesel fuel, but unfortunately there is not. This is the entry for ethyl alcohol. OSHA publishes its permissible exposure levels, or PELs, in the Code of Federal Register as well as online, but a PEL does not exist for diesel fuel. 
If you have access to an ACGIH TLV guide, you would find a listing for diesel fuel, but these exposure guidelines are not found online and must be purchased. Finally, the MSDS should contain a complete listing of exposure standards and guidelines, but too often they are incomplete or outdated. However, in this case, the MSDS does contain a comprehensive listing. Please note that in addition to the ACGIH TLV, the supplier has listed its own exposure guideline, and these exposure guidelines recognize that diesel fuel may be present in the air as an aerosol as well as a vapor. These values are all 8-hour time-weighted averages, or the amount you may be exposed to over an 8-hour work shift. Please also note that the ACGIH TLV has a skin notation. This indicates that a significant contribution to the overall exposure can occur through the skin, so wearing the appropriate PPE is even more important. But now that we have some indication of the maximum exposure level, how likely is it that one could be overexposed to diesel fuel? Is there any other way besides air monitoring that could help us answer this question? We can estimate the likelihood of exceeding an exposure standard or guideline by learning what the vapor pressure of the compound is, as well as knowing something about the task being performed and the space in which the work will be done. The vapor pressure of diesel fuel, found in Section 9 of the MSDS, is 0.4 millimeters mercury at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This places it in the low vapor pressure category according to the following table. Substances with vapor pressures less than 1 millimeter of mercury with exposure standards above 100 parts per million or 25 milligrams per cubic meter are very unlikely to lead to a significant exposure. This is because the substance, in this case diesel fuel, will become airborne or evaporate very slowly and in open areas the vapors are diluted rapidly. We can demonstrate the slow rate of evaporation by placing a tray containing diesel fuel in the sun. It hardly evaporates at all after several hours. However, in the same period of time, the tray of gasoline with a vapor pressure of approximately 38 millimeters of mercury completely evaporates. Short duration tasks such as fueling a vehicle will not result in a significant inhalation exposure. However, this may not be the case for other tasks which take place in more confined, less well-ventilated areas or in instances where the fuel may be heated and therefore have a higher vapor pressure greater than one millimeter of mercury. You will recall the vapor pressure of a compound increases with temperature. Diesel fuel exposures can easily be several times the AC GIH TLV when the fuel is heated or when working in confined spaces. An example of working in a confined area where the diesel fuel vapors have an opportunity to build up is the opening and cleaning of fuel tanks in shipyards. An example of a process that heats diesel fuel, increasing its volatility, is its use on heavy equipment to prevent hot asphalt from sticking to the equipment. Before we'd actually start our paving, we would take uh, diesel fuel and we would actually place it into Hudson sprayers and we would spray all the entire components of the machine with the diesel fuel and it prevent it from sticking as we'd be doing our work. Uh, we could be doing it five, six times in an hour on the machine and all of our tools. Of course, the asphalt itself is hot. It, it can vary anywhere from 250 to 280 degrees Fahrenheit. And basically what would happen is when it come in contact with the diesel fuel, it would start to smoke. As we'd be paving, we would have this constant white smoke along with the asphalt fume around us at all times. So assessing exposure and understanding the potential health effects of a material like diesel fuel requires a lot of information including knowledge of the toxic and chemical properties of a material as well as its exposure standards and information concerning the environment in which the material would be used and the nature of the task, such as its duration. Armed with this information, we protect ourselves, but this is only half of the picture. Let's turn our attention now to the physical hazards associated with diesel fuel. When we talk about the physical hazards of a material, we are concerned about its potential to ignite and create a fire, to explode, or to react violently with air, water, incompatible materials, and sometimes even itself. A description of material's physical hazards may be found in the NIOSH Pocket Guide if there is an entry for it or in an MSDS. 
There are two critical pieces of information we must obtain in order to understand a material's physical hazards. These are the specific hazardous characteristics possessed by the material, such as its flammable or combustible properties, and the specific conditions that must be present in order for the physical hazard to present itself, such as an ambient temperature above 72 degrees Fahrenheit. What are the flammability-related physical hazards associated with diesel fuel, and under what conditions could these hazards present themselves? We learn in section five and nine that diesel fuel possesses the hazardous characteristic of a combustible liquid. We also learned that this hazardous characteristic will present itself under the following conditions. At a temperature above 131 degrees Fahrenheit, its flash point, and when the vapor air mix is between 0.6% to 7%, the flammability range. So what this means is that if the ambient temperature remains below 131 degrees Fahrenheit, the concentration of vapors above the liquid fuel is not sufficient to ignite if a source of ignition is present. Compare this with gasoline, with a flash point of negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the flash point of gasoline is well below the ambient temperature, it immediately catches fire. However, this does not mean that diesel fuel will not catch fire in the presence of an ignition source if it comes into contact with hot objects, such as the exhaust systems of heavy equipment. The hot object, represented by this metal tray, raises the temperature of the fuel above its flash point. So far, experiments involve diesel fuel in open containers. What would happen if we placed diesel fuel in a closed container and tried to ignite it at ambient temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit? Could the vapors ignite? Let's compare diesel fuel with gasoline under the same conditions. What do you think will happen if an ignition source is present in the headspace of these containers? The diesel fuel does not ignite because not enough vapor mixes with air above the liquid fuel to reach the lower explosive limit, or LEL. However, the gasoline does ignite. The following formula can be used to calculate the equilibrium concentration of a substance in a closed container at sea level. Plugging in the vapor pressure of gasoline and diesel fuel, we can see that the equilibrium concentration of diesel fuel is approximately 0.05% or well below its lower explosive limit of 0.6%. However, the equilibrium concentration for gasoline is approximately 5%, which exceeds its lower explosive limit of 1.4%, and therefore a fire resulted. If the diesel fuel were warmed just a bit by placing it in a hot water bath or on a hot asphalt surface, the temperature of the fuel would increase, increasing its vapor pressure until enough vapor is released to reach the lower explosive limit. The last physical hazard that we need to discuss is any potential reactivity hazards associated with diesel fuel. What reactivity hazard does diesel fuel possess? Section 10 of an MSDS addresses the reactivity hazards. We learn from this section that diesel fuel is stable it will not polymerize or react with itself. We also learned that we must avoid open flames and ignition sources for all reasons we have already discussed. But the MSDS also lists materials to avoid or that diesel fuel could react with. These materials are all oxidizers. Oxidizers will initiate a fire when mixed with a material like diesel fuel. Under the right conditions, this could also initiate an explosion. Here, calcium hypochlorite, an oxidizer widely used as a pool biocide is mixed with diesel fuel and set aside. The two react slowly at first, generating heat, until sufficient heat is generated to initiate a fire. What does this review of the physical hazards of diesel fuel tell us about the way we should handle it? We must eliminate the sources of ignition when working with diesel fuel, especially when it may be heated above its flash point of 131 degrees Fahrenheit. We must also use proper bonding and grounding procedures when transferring diesel fuel. Finally, keep containers of diesel fuel closed when not in use and store them in a cool, well-ventilated areas away from incompatible materials such as oxidizers. It's really important that you understand the health and physical hazards associated with the materials you handle. Take the time to locate an MSDS or other information source and learn about them. 
Only then will you know the proper precautions that should be taken to adequately protect yourself. Hello, my name is Mike Rivers. I'm a curriculum coordinator and safety and hazmat trainer for the Operating Engineers Training Trust Local 12 in Los Angeles. I have been a member of the International Union of Operating Engineers for 18 years and my message is simple. Always be safe and always keep it safe.